The intended learning objective for today's course is to identify some of the limitations that we encounter in conventional TEM imaging, gain some insight on the basic principle of cryo-TEM, specimen preparation, limitations, and application of cryo-TEM imaging in material science and also biological science. TEM has a numerous advantages. One of them is that we can observe structures at very high magnification, which means that we can reach higher resolution than optical microscope. And we can magnify an object about 4,000 times than an optical microscope, and also 4 million times than a simple naked eye. We can observe finer details and we can look into internal structures. We can gain more insight about morphology. We can gain insights about atomic level resolution as I show here is a high resolution image of a gold nanorod where we can clearly see the each individual atoms. We can see much more such as the elemental composition of nanoparticles. However, there are limitations. One of them is that the sample should be thin enough to obtain meaningful results. Specimen thickness, if it's about 30 to 50 nanometer is optimum, but of course, 100 nanometer is an upper limit. Sample should be mechanically robust for handling because of the high vacuum and experimental condition. They have to be tolerant to high electron energy, high energy electron beam and samples undergo electron beam damage. Almost all materials suffer from this, and especially when we do use at a high dose in an electron microscope. This is due to elastic collusion that leads to the diffusion, atom displacement, or vacancy creation. It can also lead to some inelastic interaction of electron beam with the sample. It can lead to radiolysis, uh, partly because of the electronic excitation, radical formation, ion fragments, and this all lead to a local increase in the temperature of the sample, can lead to sample damage at the same time, contamination of the sample as well as the microscope. When we talk about the electron dose, a dose is nothing but the amount of the degree of electron beam irradiation. The dose is generally defined by the irradiation beam energy per unit area on the specimen and typically expressed in coulomb per square centimeter. We can control the electron dose by controlling the number of electrons per unit area, usually represented or presented as electrons per square angstrom or per square nanometer. Typically, uh, to get a good image with a low statistical noise at high magnification, a dose of one coulomb per centimeter square is necessary. That corresponds to about 600,000 electrons per square nanometer. Unfortunately, most of the amino acids are destroyed by at least two orders of magnitude lower than what we generally need to get a high magnification image with low noise. Only few compounds can be observed at doses of order of three coulombs per centimeter square. Here shows a polymer sample at 100 kilo electron volt and extremely low uh, electron dose. As you increase the dose, you can see the sample got damaged. And this is a nice example. So how the electron dose affects in, and beam damage affects the samples. Here's a more a nice movie um, uh, showing how scanning electron microscope uh, imaging also affects. If you have extremely low kilo electron volt, but we have a dose of even 3,500 electron per square nanometer, some of the sensitive samples such as lithium phosphorus oxynitride undergoes immediate beam damage. It is even more amplified when we go to biological samples. That's partly because um, as we work in electron microscope, it's generally at a high vacuum to prevent the scattering of electrons from air. Biological samples 
are typically in aqueous environment, their native environment, which means that we have to dry them before we image them. This drying creates some already drying artifact and biological specimen generate very weak contrast. As I previously mentioned that when you have uh, purely biological samples or organic samples or soft materials, it can also lead to a lot of electron beam dynamics. It can ionize the sample, it can create free radicals or break several bonds at high energy. One of the methods that has been widely used is negative staining to image or increase the contrast for a biological sample. It was introduced in 1960s, which utilizes a method where the background is stained whereas your sample or particles of interest are not stained. In this case, the background appears as a dark, whereas your objects or particles of interest will appear as light. This process utilizes some of heavy metal staining such as uranyl acetate or phosphomolybdate or uranyl formate. Here is a video showing um, uh, entire sample press procedure. Essentially what you need is a proper grid um, and staining solvent and your aqueous sample. So you take a grid uh, which is a pre-treated and you essentially uh, load your sample to the, to the grid and you need approximately about three microliter of sample. This three microliter sample, once you wait for a certain time, one to two minutes, you can remove the excess of these samples by blotting using a Wattman filter paper without actually contaminating the grids, just blotting from the edge of the TM grid. Now you can wash this several times. It's a process where you can remove, for example, if your biological sample has some salt crystals, such as uh, if you are using buffer. So you wash just by adding a few drops of water, generally two to three microliters of water, then you blot it repeatedly two to three times. Finally, after this, you can um, add a drop of your stain and the sample can be then blotted and dried and used for imaging. An alternative method is you take your TM grid, add the sample, wait for a couple of minutes, you blot the excess water and then wash it using water droplet. Here is a parafilm where you have three water droplet and then you have a droplet of stain. So essentially you roll it over the droplet, you dry and finally take it the stain and then do the imaging. So negative staining involves selection of a proper electron microscopy or TM grid. And important there is to find a proper support film. Generally, it is a polymer film or it can be a carbon film with a certain thickness. And modern day, you can also have a graphene support film. And selecting the correct mesh size to have proper stability and uh, the proper metal because the grid can be a copper, it can be gold, nickel, or depending on your own uh, use. So copper is relatively good. It provides good heat conductivity. At the same time, copper can also oxidize. If you want to store your grid, you better choose a gold grids. So you have to pre-treat your grid because carbon support film, which is hydrophobic. So the samples present in the water generally will not header or attach to the grid properly. In this case, you need to do some pre-treatment to improve the hydrophilicity so that all the aqueous samples can be attached. One way to use is called plasma cleaning or glow discharge, which actually creates a temporary charge, which is for about 20 to 30 minutes, which does not need any chemicals. However, it requires a specialized device and it may not be uniform. You can also use a chemical way of uh, adding and uh, making the grids uh, um, modify the surface of the support film, such as using Aussian blue, 
However, um, this has also some disadvantage because you make some chemical modification. Finally, you have to adsorb your um, specimen or the object of interest. So it can be uh, the one which I've shown in the video, or you can in incubate it for a longer time if, if necessary. If the sample is extremely dilute, then along with the grid and in a appendorf, you can centrifuge. This way, all the particles will settle on your grid. Finally, you wash, as I shown, two to four times using deionized water or a buffer to avoid any damage to the sample. Here I show the examples uh, of negatively stained uh, three, one virus bacteriophage. This is T4 page. Tobacco mosaic virus is a rod-like virus. And this is the coronavirus that is a very relevant with the current ongoing um, crisis. So in the staining, what we look is essentially to have extremely a dilute, a heavy metal uh, solution. It should not destroy the sample or bring too many artifacts. And it has to be thin enough if it is, um, and it should not positively interact with the sample. If positively interact, your entire TM grid will look dark. Here you can clearly see the background is dark, whereas your particles are light. And same here, you can clearly see the core of coronavirus and then all the spike around this um, uh, core. We can also use cryo-electron microscopy imaging as neg negative staining um, for other particles. Don't have to be only for biological particle. Also design or engineered uh, biological particles such as DNA origami, which is synthesized in the lab. Here I saw three uh, different DNA particle. One is a more rod-like particle, a rectangular particle, and a plate-like particle. And if you, because DNA has surface negative charges, if you treat with certain lipids, then it forms some kind of a, a lipid bilayer structure. And you can clearly see this kind of structure by simply a negative staining and imaging. In the, this panel, what we saw is the individual particles, the rectangular type, the rod-like or fiber type, and the plates. In this size, we saw how you add different ratio of origami and lipid, and then you can get a higher order structures. And here is a highly, as a negative staining is very good. We can see the particles clearly, which can distinguish from the background. This is a very good example because in these two cases, the staining is not the best. But as we move on to the, here, this is one of the example where there's a clear distinction between the background and the particles. So we can see the stripes across the entire structure. However, negative staining has limitation, uh, such as if you have a protein, it can say that whether it's a globular or elongated, but it cannot reveal the secondary structure of protein, such as alpha helix or beta states or beta strands. It's very challenging to do negative staining of membrane proteins. It's partly due to that when you remove the membrane proteins from natural environment, they start to aggregate. The membrane proteins are very difficult to produce also in large amounts, and they do not crystallize. So therefore, negative staining, even though it's excellent, it's not applicable and it's not universal. That's where the challenge was solved already in 1970s and 80s. And as many of you know, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2017 was awarded to Joachim Frank, Richard Henderson, and Jacques Duboset for their contribution in developing cryo-electron microscopy for the high resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution. However, it is not limited to biomolecules anymore. It is even used for uh, material science and also battery materials as we discuss move on to this lecture. 
The first cryo TM attempt was made by Taylor and Glaser, who used catalase as their sample, and they free froze this sample conventionally, and then loaded the sample to a cryo stage that was maintained at liquid nitrogen step temperature. Even though they were able to provide a nice electron diffraction, this entire sample resulted in crystalline ice and irreversible sample damage. This problem was solved by Jacques Duboset, who has provided a new method of sample preparation to avoiding the crystals. If you slowly crystallize water, you will have a lot of crystals, either hexagonal ice crystals or cubic crystals. But now, instead of that, if you rapidly freeze water below 144 degrees Celsius, you have an amorphous solid, a glass that is not crystalline. However, to do such cooling, liquid nitrogen is not suitable because it is not a good conductor uh, of heat. For that, the Bursett used liquid ethane or liquid propane or a 50 50 mixture of uh, these two because they have melting point below minus 180 degrees Celsius and they can conduct heat much rapidly. That means when you dip the sample, you can rapidly cool your sample. So in this situation, the sample is cooled so fast that around 20,000 degrees Celsius per minute. In this condition, it will form a a non-crystalline solid or amorphous glassy state. And this entire process is called vitrification or cryovitrification. So vitrification is the rapid cooling of liquid medium in the absence of crystal formation. What happens in this case, if you rapidly cool, there is no ice crystal formed. The structures, if you have different molecules or particles randomly oriented, you can rapidly freeze them by maintaining their structures without any disturbance. Since this glassy state has no crystals, biological materials are least affected. Imagine you have a lot of water inside the cell. If it crystallizes, it breaks the cells, it deforms the cells. So this is a great advantage for a lot of particles which are sensitive for crystallization. So therefore, it's important that you don't cool the sample, your TM grid very slow because you will get ice, which that means it leads to irreversible phase transition and ice samples uh, destroy your particles. Here is a video showing how the entire process is done. Uh, essentially, you cool liquid ethane or propane in this uh, bronze cup here we have a place where outside you add liquid nitrogen and cool it. And this spindle will actually conduct the heat so that this bronze cup is cooled very rapidly to minus 185 or minus 190 degrees Celsius. Then you pass gaseous liquid ethane or liquid propane or mixture of them, it will form um, at this temperature, then you can uh, rapidly plunge your sample inside. Before plunging, you have to use a dedicated device, which is called wit robot or the robot uh, used for vitrification. So you attach your grate using a tweezer, and then you load your sample to the grate. And again, you need only about two to three microliter of sample. And now the grid is here. You load the sample about three microliter to the grid. And then everything it can be controlled using the computer. And you can quickly blot. This blotting leads to 100 to 70 to 100 nanometer thick ice. And we can rapidly plunge it. Therefore, this entire process is called plunge freezing. And then from liquid nitrogen, you can transfer it to liquid, liquid propane to liquid nitrogen. And you can store it in liquid nitrogen as long as you want. Once the ice or amorphous ice is formed, that is stable as long as you maintain the temperature. So if everything is 
goes accordingly, you are able to manage the sample press and you have the TM grid, which has a very thin eyes. What you have is the, the metallic grid, and then you have the support film, and the support film has certain structure. It can be very nicely ordered holes, which are called holy grid or quantifiles. The size can change from 50 micron to several microns. And the ice is formed at the hole. So here now, this ice acts as a matrix for your particles. And this is extremely thin. So now the electron beam can pass through and ice act as a, as a support film in this case. Here is showing a negatively stained T4 bacteriophage and same bacteriophage when you image in cryogenic conditions. And in cryogenic conditions, of course, you can see all the details, except that there is a higher noise. That's because of the low dose uh, imaging at the same time, also the presence of water. In this case, the particles embedded inside the water or the vitrified ice. We can look into more detailed structures as the bacteria and the bacterial uh some of the structures inside the bacterial cell or rod like particle as i shown the tobacco mosaic virus here with some gold nanorods which are docked more importantly to understand the structure of virus particles here is the latest coronavirus uh, structure it's a cryo electron microscope image as you can see here and then we have the core and then we have all the spike proteins which are coming out. Of course, here is a high noise, but there is a method to uh, overcome this noise. It's called uh, signal averaging. This way we can improve the noise signal to noise ratio. It's not only for biological particles, but we can make hybrid particles, synthetic um, molecules and reaction with the cage, which leads to, for example, nice uh, large crystals. But of course, these crystals are not stable. Then only way to identify how the each protein cages are arranged uh, by interacting with this type of synthetic molecule is using cryogenic electron microscopy, where we can get the diffraction pattern. At the same time, we can also identify the inter particle distance and uh, unit cell and the lattice constant. So overall, it is a very good complementary technique to support observation in solutions such as small angle X-ray scattering. It's also important that we can study various other nanostructures, um, such as, for example, nanofibers arranged from gels. Here is an AFM image of a gel fiber from agarose. Agarose is routinely used in various applications, including in food applications. In AFM, of course, you need to dry the sample, then you start to see the small fibers are bundled together. And if you take this gel in cryotium, we can see individual fibers of uh, four to five nanometer in diameter, but indefinite length, where we can actually prevent any kind of bundling or entanglement. As I said, the cryotium is not only for biological studies. Its application, of course, started in a lot in biological science, but it has moved to polymers, metal organic framers, battery materials, active materials, and to study catalysis. I will show one example of how it is useful to study battery materials. Especially when you study something that is um, highly sensitive to the environment. Most of the electrochemical processes in a battery are highly dynamic, and it is very difficult to understand the charge and discharge cycles in batteries. Especially, it's important in the current increase in electric vehicles and the need for the electric vehicles and the batteries and improve the battery life. Conventional TM, of course, is not able to preserve the native state of any chemically reactive and beam sensitive materials after operation. So we need a solution for this. This is one of the fantastic paper that appeared a few years ago, where they have used cryogenic TM to study the battery material. And more example, it's also a very good example 
how we started with the beam damage. Here is the cryotium image of, uh, of this battery material. Uh, I think it is uh, lithium based. And yes, if you take a conventional or standard image, within a few minutes, you start to see the complete beam damage and it's so reactive and you can see the hole, it's completely burned. But in cryogenic TM, you can image it for longer time. Not only that, you can even look at, for example, every single atom in a given area. That means you can image not only for longer time, at the same time, also for higher resolution. This is, uh, gives you a tremendous amount of information to study uh, the electrochemical process in in situ TM. However, cryo TM has a lot of limitations. Uh, as I said that uh, in the beginning, for imaging, we need um, 30 to 100 nanometer thick sample. If it's above that, it's very challenging. That means that if we are looking about the ice formation in the holes of the TM support film, which essentially means that if the ice thickness is above 100 or 150 nanometer, it will be very challenging to correct good image and we cannot get good transmission. So there is a limitation of ice thickness, which means that if we now have particle size, a lot of biological sample cells, et cetera, then if they're above 100 nanometer, then they undergo deformation because, or it, it can come outside the ice. So the particle size limitation, ice thickness, and the method of getting good amorphous ice also brings a lot of limitation. But there are other methods uh, that can overcome this, such as sectioning or cryosectioning or microtoming that might help in overcoming these problems. We will discuss more about cryotium and application and single particle reconstruction in the next lecture about electron tomography.